Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra. I'm professor of political science and also professor of Chicano studies. I'm also director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Tonight, you're gonna to witness the Urban Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that's been going on here at the university for over 10 years. We bring all kinds of community, uh, business, and nonprofit individuals to come and talk to us about issues facing our city. We hope you enjoy the show today and stay tuned for a great conversation about our great city. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra, professor of Chicano studies and professor of political science. And I'm also the director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Uh, we've been doing this urban lecture series for over 10 years and for the last five years it's been televised by Channel 36, our partners in putting this together. In addition to the Chicano Studies Department, Political Science, we are also sponsored by Urban Studies, uh, Economics, Political Science, American Cultures, and African American Studies. A variety of different departments and many of the students representing those departments are here in our audience. Uh, today we're going to be talking about city finances, city politics, and we have two guests who are intimately involved in everything that occurs with the city. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have Miguel Santana. He is the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Los Angeles. Another way of saying it is he, he's the CEO. Uh, many people think that the mayor is the CEO, and the mayor thinks he's the CEO. But in reality, on a day-to-day on a -day basis, it is Mr. Santana who runs this. Um, in 2009, uh, Miguel Santana was nominated by Mayor Antonio Villarregosa to be uh, the CAO, and he was confirmed by the City Council. Uh, Mr. Santana is one of the few city officers who reports directly to the mayor and to the city council. So he doesn't have one boss. He's got 16, many, 16 15 council members and, and one mayor. Uh, prior to this position, Mr. Santana served as one of the five deputy chief executive officers for, the Los, for Los Angeles County. So one of the themes that we'll have today is really comparing the city and the county and how they, they do things differently. Uh, in addition, uh, Mr. Uh, well, as Deputy CAO for the County of Los Angeles, Mr. Santana provided oversight to all of the county's social service departments, including the Department of Children and Family Services, Public Social Services, Child Support, Military and Veteran Affairs, and the Human Relations uh, Commission, which is really some of the more significant departments in, in, in the county. Um, most recently, he's managing director of the uh, Sunshine Nathan and Rosenthal Consulting on high-profile cases, including the Dan Rathers versus CBS uh, lawsuit, uh, amongst others. Uh, prior to that, he was also chief of staff to Supervisor Gloria Molina, who will be one of our guests in a couple of uh, uh, months or weeks. Uh, and he's worked also prior to that with uh, MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, Mr. Santana got his BA in Sociology and Latin American Studies from Whittier College and his master's degree in Public Administration from Harvard University. Um, I recommended that he go to Harvard after we uh, denied his entrance here at LMU and I thought he could get in and he did. Uh, Mr. Santana is married to Sandra Santana, a human resources specialist and he has four daughters. Uh, their two eldest daughters attend Columbia University and Barnard College in New York City. So he loves to go back east to uh, uh, say hello to them. Um, he is in the front lines of everything that happens in Los Angeles, including these uh, incredible, uh, difficult budget years. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to ask about why he took this job, how he was approached, and uh, what, uh, number one, has been the biggest surprise to you in terms of being CAO, even though you had that experience in, in, in Los Angeles County. Um, did you apply for the job or did they come asking you, do you want to be uh, a CAO? How, how did that happen? Um, good evening. Um, you know, I, I've been very fortunate that in my career I only, I've only applied for one job. Um, and that was um, my job when I got out of college working at MALDEF and since then, I've been fortunate enough to be tapped on the shoulder and being asked uh, um, to take a position. And that was the case in this latest position that I have as the CAO for the City of Los Angeles. Um, it, it, I've known the mayor for 20 years. Uh, I met him prior to him being elected to the State Assembly um, in 1994. He was a, uh, the alternate for Supervisor Molina on 
uh, the transportation authority at that time when they could have alternates. Um, and we have worked with him since then. And so um, when he became the mayor and they, you know, they had uh, my former boss, Bill Fujioka, who is the CEO for the County of Los Angeles as uh, the CAO in the city, uh, he left to go to the county and there was someone interim and when that person left, uh, he approached me and asked me if I would consider the job. Um, I, you know, at first I, you know, I was very happy at the county. I, I, I've spent my, most of my career at the county of Los Angeles. Um, what I'm passionate about personally is social services and human and health care issues. Um, uh, but as the deputy CEO at the county, I oversaw uh, $9 billion of the $22 billion of their budget um, and dealt with a lot of fiscal issues uh, as well as, um, as the social service side of it. And as Chief of Staff to Supervisor Molina, uh, where she is both the mayor and the city council for the unincorporated parts of the first district, which... Uh, I want to stop you there for a second. I want the students to clearly understand that. In Los Angeles County, there are 88 cities and about one million people in the county do not live in any of those eight cities. They live in unincorporated areas. So an example nearby Loyola Marymount is Marina Del Rey, for instance. Um, also Ladera Heights, I think, um, and then uh, um, Willowbrook and, and areas like that. A million people live in those, and they have no city council. So the county is its city council to some extent. They do all the land use, et cetera. Okay? In addition, he made reference to we don't have a mayor in Los Angeles County. So there's five supervisors. So in, in an interesting way of uh, governmental organization, each supervisor is both the executive and the legislature in terms of the city council. And then there's the informal politics of LA County in that uh, supervisors will allow one supervisor to really be the lead in their own district. And, and the kind of thing about if you let me do what I want in my district, I'll let you do what you want in your district. So in essence, each supervisor becomes their, uh, uh, a, a, uh, a king or queen of their fiefdom. Now, you don't have to answer or agree to that, but... No, that's uh, true. Okay, it's true. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't work for them anymore. <laughs> so that would, I, mean, so I, I want you to understand those politics, how different that is than the city of L.A. that's got 15 council members and an executive. So there's no veto power at the county. Nobody can veto legislation. That's correct. And so for if, if you're a resident of East Los Angeles, for example, with approximately 200,000 people who live in East L.A., uh, your mayor and your city council is Supervisor Gloria Molina. And so um, it's, it's one um, very straightforward uh, relationship with your, with your government. Uh, she's accountable for all of the issues, the planning issues, uh, the public safety issues, uh, the trash, the tree maintenance, the recreational services, all of the services that a city would provide. Um, and so as her chief of staff, I was essentially sort of a de facto city manager for those areas. Um, and in, in the case of Supervisor Molina, there's, as Dr. Garrett indicated, there's a million people who live in the unincorporated. It would be the second largest city in the county of L.A second to only the city of LA if it were to be its own city. Um, um, and so as in that capacity, um, there's clearly uh, a number of issues that prepared me for this job uh, as uh, CEO for the city of LA. So um, one of the major things you have to deal with, of course, is the budget. And we have a, um, a, a uh, not a PowerPoint that we're going to go through, but it's been passed out. I know there's not enough, and we're going to have uh, uh, on the, we'll give you the website, okay? And for those of you out on uh, TV land, we'll also give you that website and let you know where you can uh, take, a, take a look at this. But um, if for the students, if you can turn to, um, first of all, this was prepared for what audience? This was, um, the mayor and I last week were in New York City, and we met with uh, people who purchase our bonds. We issue uh, well over a billion dollars of bonds each year. And um, we also met with the various bond rating agencies, the, the, the agencies that tell those other people who buy our bonds whether we're a worthwhile risk. And, um, and, to, and to, our purpose was to give them an update on our budget 
to let them know uh, what we've been doing, uh, what challenges we've been facing. We gave them a status report on where we are today, and then we gave them a, a, a glimpse of what we're going to be doing in the next six months to not only address the immediate shortfall that we're facing, which is approximately $50 million um, for the remain through now and June 30th, but an additional $350 million uh, deficit starting uh, July 1. Uh, our, our calendar year are, is based on a fiscal year calendar and it starts on July 1. And so because uh, we will be generating a lot of press on, on our, our work, which sometimes causes concern among people who buy our bonds, they're concerned whether we're going to be able to pay them back. And the bond rating agencies that tell them whether or not we're a safe credit risk, uh, we wanted to meet with them in advance and let them know what we are up to and what they're likely to see. And we delivered on that very quickly on, on Saturday. I don't know if you read in the LA Times. Um, I, had a, I issued a report to the mayor and the council regarding the current state of our finances, um, which generated yeah, you know, some press. To us, if it's not in the Loyola, it's actually not that important. Okay. So many of us do read. Well, the I need to subscribe then. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I want the uh, students to understand is when we talk about the rating agencies, uh, every city has a different rating. So think about the rating agencies like either AAA, AA. Think about that as though your FICO score, and you have a you have an individual credit rating, and it's your FICO score. And so, if your what happens to you if your FICO score goes uh, down? you get less credit or the credit card uh, company tends to charge you a little bit uh, more interest rate or what have you. Same thing for the city of LA. They have a FICO score and we call it a rating. And so, un uh, and so you, if you had the opportunity to go before all the people who put together your FICO score and explain everything, why you missed that payment last month, um, why you didn't get a, a, um, your car payment in on time or what have you, uh, and that's essentially what he was doing, he and the mayor, last week. They were before the rating agencies or before these FICO people saying, hey, this is why we did what we did, et cetera. And that's what you have. So let's turn to page uh, four. Um, in, uh, and you, on that page, you have a, a map of the city, the uh, council districts uh, lined up. What are the little red spots? Fire uh, stations. Fire stations, right. Okay. So how did the mayor do? Because you had him talk first. No, the, I think the mayor did a good job. I think what they wanted to hear from the mayor was whether or not he had the political will to make the tough decisions that are in front of him. And it's no different than when you go to your parents and say, look, I, I, I need to borrow or could I have an extra uh, couple hundred bucks to, to pay my rent or whatever it is. And your, your parents are saying, well, you know, how much did you spend on beer this month? How much did you spend on pizza? You know, how many times did you go to the movies? And if they're going to give you those 200 bucks, they're going to want to know that you're going to spend it on your rent and not on more beer. And so the, basically we were doing the exact same thing. Okay, but I know they're going to spend it on more <laughs> beer, so they, they know. Well, well the, the trick is fooling your parents and thinking that you're not. But and, and, and I can't do that, otherwise I go in jail. It's called securities fraud. Um, but but the, the, the point is, is it's the same thing. And so they, I could, as a CAO, I'm not elected, and I could, I, all I do is provide recommendations at the end of the day. I don't have a vote on the city council. I don't have veto power. Yeah, but you struck, I mean, while you don't do that, you begin the conversation by the how you package the information, you structure the options and all that. You, you, uh, that that's a very important thing. While you ultimately don't have the vote, you, how the conversa conversation is going to uh, unfold in terms of what budget cuts, taxes, and all that, you begin that process. That, that's correct. So I provide them sort of the framework. I, I give them. Uh, sort of a, a prediction of how things are going to be. I provide recommendations how to address them. And so I could make that case to the mayor and the council, and I could also make it to the bond rate agencies and our bondholders and say, look, this is, this is what our plan is, this is what we've been doing. But only the mayor, as, as the elected official representing the entire city, can say, I have the political will to actually do these things. So it's not just that the CAO is making these recommendations. 
I am willing to, to make the tough decisions and, and do whatever I can to ensure that the city is balanced. And that is very important in this day and age. And the, and the reason it is, is that many cities, and not all cities, are confronting very difficult times. Um, the city of Chicago, for example, anyone from Chicago here? Okay. Well, your city has a $1 billion deficit. Uh, so mine pales in comparison at 350. Misery loves <laughs> company, and you always want to be able to compare that. You're right. doing a little bit better. You know, San Francisco, Sacramento, San Diego, um, San Antonio, uh, New York. Uh, virtually every city in the in the in the country is facing a fiscal challenge, and and our story is is similar to the rest of our counterparts. And so, why is that why are we having budget deficits? Well, there's a couple of things that are happening all at once. The first thing is that we experienced the worst recession this country has ever experienced since the Great Depression, and um, to, to put it in context, when we, we experience for four or five consecutive quarters double-digit drops in our revenue. And that means that our revenue was falling at a very quick rate in a very short period of time. The last time we experienced as a city the same drop in revenue was during the Great Depression. All the recessions we've had, the ones in the, in the 90s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and between now and the Great Depression, were not as bad as this one. So all of a sudden, we, we, we had two things happen. We had this unprecedented growth driven by property taxes, driven by people purchasing homes at, a, at very high prices. And uh, here in Los Angeles, like other parts of the country, was no different. And then all of a sudden, in one day, all of that stopped. And then the free fall started. And so meanwhile, while that growth was occurring and occurred over a five-year period, we as a government grew at the same time. So we, we, uh, we started hiring more police officers to keep the city safe. Uh, we started paving more roads. We started uh, hiring more librarians to uh, staff our expanded library system. Um, so experiencing that growth and expanding it. So now, on one, in one day, you saw a drop. And now you have a workforce of a certain size and, and expenditures at a certain size. And you don't have the revenue that comes with it. And so the most telling picture of that is really on, on chart number seven, for those of you who have it. So in, in 2007, eight, we had uh, a workforce that. And, and, and this graph is uh, entitled Authorized City Staffing. So you're basically talking about city employees. So in 2008, we maintained, we grew our police department slightly. And we've maintained that police department at the same level and the fire department. Um, we grew positions in the special funds. And, and what we had to do literally in a period of 18 months, because we saw this drop in revenue, we had to reduce the size of the workforce as quickly as possible. The city has never done this before. So what'd you do, fire people? We had to lay people off. We laid off about 500 people. That's more people that have ever been laid off in the city's history. Um, if you were to, I mean, I think there maybe it was a, there have been a dozen people that have been laid off up until this point. Uh, we uh, had an early retirement program. We basically encouraged employees who were close to retirement age to actually retire early. And we had about 2,400 people uh, retire under that program. And we also did stop hiring. And in government, every position is, actual, is an actual ordinance, which is in some ways a law. And so every year in the budget, the council approves so many positions. And those positions are budgeted. So that means there's money attached to them. And so what we did was we actually stopped hiring, except for police officers. We literally, it's almost impossible to get a job in the city. Um, and uh, 
we took all those positions away, so we swept them. So we intentionally created vacancies and we swept them. As it, the net result of that is that we reduced the size of our workforce by 10% in a very short period of time. Um, and so that was part of the message that we're trying to tell the bond rating agencies and investors and say, look, we're, we're doing our part to keep a balanced budget. We're, we're making the tough decisions. We're reducing the size of the workforce. On top of that, every civilian employee that we currently have is being furloughed. And a furlough is basically telling somebody that they have um, to work four days instead of five. Hey, good seeing you. Uh, four days instead of five, and on that fifth day, they don't come to work and they don't get paid. So we are here at Loyola Marymount University uh, taking a look at uh, city finances, state finances. Uh, we are joined by State Senator uh, Alex Padilla. He is currently in his uh, second or first term. I've already lost count. Start of the second. Started, he's starting his second term representing the San Fernando Valley. Uh, prior to being in the state legislature, he was on the city council. And on the city council, he was president of the council which meant that any time the mayor was out of the city, he was the acting mayor. Uh, when he got elected at the ripe old and wise age of 26, he was 26 years old, and he ran for city council. I don't know what the heck you were thinking, but you know, he, he won. So that's- you know any better. You didn't know, that's uh, <laughs> like, kind of like some of the essays that I get from some of my students. They don't know any better. Anyway, he, I can go on and on and talk about uh, Alex Padilla, but uh, um, I want to just go back and finish up with uh, some of the uh, main points about the city budget, and then we'll turn it around and blame it all on the state, where Alex now is, about how it's ruined the uh, city finances. So go ahead, go ahead and, uh, and finish, Miguel, with, the, with uh, uh, um, some of the uh, comments that you had. So I, I'll summarize by saying, so what we've done is we've done, we've reduced the size of the workforce for those people that are working for us. They're basically getting a reduced salary uh, for the majority of them. Uh, sworn have been impacted because we basically stopped all overtime in the police department. Uh, and if, you're, if you are a police officer, you're used to getting about $700 to $900 on top of your salary each month of overtime. You buy your homes with that assumption. You buy your boats or your whatever things you have with that. So suddenly they, they've seen a drop. And we've done the same thing in the fire department. So every city employee, from myself to the mayor to uh, people who pick up trash, well, not, not the folks who pick up trash because they're under special funds, but rec and park individuals are all experiencing a reduction in their salaries. Um, so you would think that as a result of having made these very difficult decisions, uh, includes layoffs, furloughs, reducing the size of government, uh, that we would be okay. And the unfortunate reality is, is that we still have a problem. Uh, we've, we're about a third from where we ultimately need to be. And the reason why, and this is true for the state and it's true for virtually every level of government, that the cost of doing business is becoming more and more expensive. And those costs are driven by healthcare. You know, healthcare alone goes up 10% each year in, in, in the city for our workforce, which is similar to what it is in the private sector. Um, pension costs go up. You know, when you, you, all of you are very far away from retirement, um, but when you, people today are living much longer than they've ever lived in human history. So our pension system was designed in the 1950s, 1940s, uh, when people didn't live as long as they did. So if you, if you worked 30 years as a city employee and, and uh, retire at the age of 55 or 60, you're likely to have an additional 20 to 30 years left in your life that you're guaranteed a pension system. And so those costs, because people are living longer and because there's also an increased cost in health care, because we also provide our retirees health care, uh, are making the pension system that we have today very difficult to manage. Um, and so, uh, so while we have a smaller workforce, the workforce that we have and all the all the folks who are retired, we have almost as many 
people retired getting a paycheck as we do people working. And that number is going to grow every year. We had this discussion. I mean, two things that you'll pick up from this discussion today compared to last week, and that is uh, the whole discussion uh, about bonds that we talked about. We had uh, uh, last week the uh, head of the MWD, uh, Jeff Keitlinger, here, and we also had the uh, number two guy at the MTA, uh, Paul Taylor. And they talked quite a bit about bonds and the role that bonds play. And you can see that how important the bond issues are, and therefore this whole presentation made to the people who rate and buy those bonds is very, very significant. Uh, sec second thing, when we started talking about the budgets of those two entities, the MTA and the MWD, we started talking about pension funds. And, and, uh, and we talked about the distinction between direct benefit and direct contribution. Most public employees are direct benefit. Most uh, um, private sector employees, including here at LMU, we are at direct contribution. You want to explain the difference between those two? Yeah, it, it, under a um, defined contribution program, um, you uh, pay into, instead of, you, you basically make a contrib part of your salary goes for your pension and you manage that money. So. Um, some, some jurisdictions match it, so for every dollar you put in, they'll match a dollar. Uh, other jurisdictions don't. And so you are basically in charge of that. The, the benefit of that to you as the employee is that it, once you leave that job, it, you take it with you. So if you go to a different job, then it becomes portable in many cases. The negative side of that is that if you invest in and you experience a loss in the stock market, your nest egg gets impacted. And, and your employer will not make up the difference. Right. You're you are ne not guaranteed a certain amount when you retire. In a defined uh, benefit plan, you still make a contribution as part of your salary. In the city's case, uh, starting July 1st, all civilian employees make a 7% contribution of their salary towards their pension. And that gets pooled with everybody else's and is managed by a separate entity. And th what they do is they collectively invest those dollars and you are then in turn guaranteed a certain level of benefit once you retire, irregardless of what the market does. And so once that happens, if the market were to go down like it did a few years ago, then the city makes up that difference. And so part of what made this problem um, sort of uh, take place at a much quicker rate was because we saw a drop in stock markets and we were still obligated to pay people's pensions. And so we had a huge bill to pay overnight. And what we try to do is spread it out within a period of time, but it still means that we were paying a much higher rate than what we were used to paying. And, and in, from one year to the next. And so that's really, there's pluses and minuses in both cases, and I'm sure if you follow uh, local government, if you follow politics, there's a lot of discussion around it. Um, the challenge is transitioning from one to the other. It's much like Social Security does. The people who work today are paying for the people who are retired now. And so if suddenly you kept your money when you start working, and it didn't go to the bigger pot, then who would be paying for the people who are retired today? And so that, that becomes the challenge to transition from one benefit plan to the other. Let me ask you one last question before I uh, bring in Alex. W how has the state and its budget problems impacted the city and its budget problems? How has it exacerbated how, and, and what's going on right now? Maybe touch on the whole redevelopment that's going on. Right. And that, the governor's current proposal about redevelopment. Um, well, this, the state um, has pretty much figured out every way to take money from the city, and it's pretty much, uh, and it predates uh, the senator being on the, on the, in the, in the legislature. And I mean, it's a long tradition of that for, for 20 years or so. I remember the county when I was at the county in the early 90s. Uh, Willie Brown led an effort to uh, balance the state's budget on on the backs of of counties and cities, which created a, a, a problem there. Um, the, so there's, in terms of the general fund, which is what pays for police officers, firefighters, rec and parks, libraries, all of the basic service that most of us 
interface with. The, we are not likely to experience any further reductions as a res result of the state budget. There is a, a proposal that the governor has made re regarding redevelopment dollars, and uh, there, is, there are community redevelopment areas that basically are designed to help uh, create economic activity in blighted areas. So what you do is you look at a map and you, and you, and you draw a circle around it and basically say that for any taxes that are generated in within that jurisdiction, those taxes, instead of going to the city and to the county and to the state, will, will be reinvested back into that community so you could in, um, initiate economic development. The skyline that you see in downtown LA, most of that was created w using this, this kind of uh, mechanism. It's a way of subsidizing developers, frankly, to, to uh, build up the economy, create jobs, and to revitalize uh, areas. Um, the governor has proposed eliminating those districts and having that money be used for the first year to help the city in its fiscal crisis. And then for the years after that, it would be distributed normally as if it didn't exist. So the city would get its 20%, the county would get its share, and the state would get its share. And so that does not impact the general fund directly. That is strictly related to the redevelopment areas. Um, there are some who argue that the redevelopment program is basically a, a welfare program for the rich. Uh, you know, there was some controversy when um, the proposed uh, Eli Broad Museum received a subsidy of over uh, $50 million to help build a, a, a parking garage and a, a sort so are of... You, are you in favor of that? Um, in, in favor of the governor's proposal? No, no, Eli Broad Museum receiving a subsidy for the parking lot. You know, I, I think that it... It's a yes or no question. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I think it's a good idea. I, don't know. I have I, tenure, though. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to give a political answer. I think it's a lot more complicated than yes and no. I mean, it, there's a long tradition of the city doing it, um, and for a variety of areas. The question is, would Mr. Broad have built his museum had not that subsidy been in place? And so if the question is he would not have done it, then bringing in a world-class museum with some of the most well known art, pieces of art in the heart of downtown LA uh, to be part of a district that is being created through Grand Avenue makes sense. Yeah, I mean, he's if, not making money. It's not a for-profit. No, it's a non-profit. And if Mr. Broad intended to do it anyway, uh, and it was just a way of reducing the overall cost of the project, then, then I think it probably didn't make sense. So I think it comes down to whether that subsidy was enough to encourage him to move forward in that with this particular project. And, and uh, my expectation is that this uh, community development uh, agency, which oversees this particular project, I don't, uh, would have done his due diligence and would have crunched the numbers and would have determined that this project would have not penciled out without that subsidy. Um, and ultimately why they would recommend it. I'll take that as a yes. Um, we are at Loyola Marymount University with our two guests, uh, Miguel Santana, Chief Administrative Officer of the City of Los Angeles, and Mr. Alex Padilla, State Senator uh, in the um, California State Legislature representing the San Fernando Valley. Mr. Padilla was first elected to the City Council in 1999 when he was 26 years old. Within two years after the next election cycle in uh, 2001, he was elected by his colleagues to be the Council President. Uh, a, a task almost as difficult to, in terms of getting elected uh, to the um, uh, uh, city council by your uh, constituents. Uh, you got to think about 15 council members. They all have very big egos. They all think they should be the leader. And imagine amongst those 15 getting to be elected the leader of that group. Uh, upon almost immediately upon being elected uh, uh, president, council president, uh, within a couple of months, we had 9/11, uh, September 11th. Uh, a tragedy in New York. At that particular time, then Mayor Hahn was in Washington, D.C. and could not leave. 
And as I mentioned to you before, when the mayor is out of the city, the president of the council becomes acting mayor. So during that whole week when Mayor Han was stuck in D.C., uh, Alex Padilla, then 28 years old, was the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, trying to respond to what was happening, whether we're getting reports about po potential attacks at uh, LAX and other places. As you recall, some of those planes were heading to L.A. before they uh, ended up uh, back in New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. Um, what was that like during that time period? Uh, what, what, uh, when, you, when you think back, you had two years' experience in government, uh, very little experience being 28, and here you are having to direct the uh, chief of police, the head of the airports, and all that in terms of what was going to be our response, how were we dealing with this, uh, probably dealing with the White House and also dealing with the mayor. What, what was happening during that time? It was... Um you know, I'll never forget that day, obviously. Nobody will uh, forget that day. It's one of those moments where uh, everybody remembers where they were when they first heard the news and what they were doing and what that day was like. Uh, you know, for me, I remember getting a call from a friend of mine uh, who works or used to work at Merrill Lynch. Uh, and she said, you know, hey, uh, turn the TV on. There's uh, something happened in New York. Uh, you're in government. You probably ought to know about this. We're not sure what's going on uh, because of her friends or co-workers that were in, in uh, some of the buildings in New York and New Jersey, and they were sort of on the ground. Uh, so I turned the TV on, uh, saw sort of the smoke of uh, the first plane, what was happening. I'm half asleep, kind of you know, rubbing my eyes. Uh, the news flashes over to the Pentagon because they had just been hit. Uh, and I'm watching, I used to watch the Today Show. Uh, so I'm watching, Katie Kirk was still on that show, and Matt Lauer, and literally in the background, the second plane goes in. Now I'm really awake. Like, what the heck is going on here? So, uh, you know, when, when you get elected to office, you get a lot of briefings, a lot of uh, orientations, if you will. It's almost like orientation when you first came to college. You know, what to expect, you know, how to find your way around campus, and, you know, if this happens, who to call, or what the resources are available to you. Uh, well, same thing in government. When you first uh, get elected, there's official and unofficial briefings, you know, how to, how to cast a vote, you know, how to... Uh, chair a committee meeting, uh, and in that line of briefings, you have uh, sort of an emergency preparedness briefing, the people in charge of that for the city or for the county or for the state or anywhere else, they'll walk you through. In the event of an emergency, here's kind of what the protocols are, uh, and here's what we try to do to prepare for emergencies. So when 9-11 happened, uh, okay, what do we do? Well, do you guys remember the, the earthquake drills in school? You know, after you've heard it so many times, okay, you know how to get under your desk, or there's probably an escape plan around here somewhere. We may not have memorized that, but we know that there's, that it exists. Uh, well, when it comes to emergencies in the city of LA, there's an emergency uh, uh, preparedness uh, director, uh, and there's uh, just the person to call. Uh, so I got my, uh, I started making phone calls first, my chief of staff, the chief of police, all the people I knew I needed to be in touch with to... Did you realize that the mayor was out and that you were acting mayor right away? Oh yeah, it didn't take very long for me to recall like, oh... I'm in right. charge. The, mayor, the, mayor, the mayor's in D.C., that means I'm in charge, but what do I do? Uh, my first call was to my chief of staff, got voicemail, left a message. Second call was to the mayor, got voicemail, left a message. Third call was to the chief of police, who was Bernard Parks at the time, uh, because the chief of police is the sort of the, the chair of the emergency operations board. Uh, and we connected and we're sort of going through, well, what do you know, what have you heard, what do you know, what have you heard, what do we do next? Uh, and then all of my calls started getting returned. At some point I figured I gotta stop answering this phone, I gotta get dressed, get downtown. And uh, it was pretty chaotic. But for the next three days, it's, you know, there was a lot of decisions, a lot of information going back and forth, but one of the early lessons I knew, maybe it was just judgment or instinct, it's now is not the time to to question the procedures and the protocols. Now's the time to follow them. And if they turn out to not be perfect, we'll have plenty of time later to kind of revise what the procedures and protocols ought to be. But for now, you know, we put these systems in place exactly for occasions like this. Uh, and so it happened. I mean, since, since you touched on the topic, one of the uh, lessons, well, two quick stories about 9-11. Remember, the first decision I had to make was I was approached by the uh, chief of the fire department at the time. You know, he rushes into the emergency operations board. Everybody's still trying to figure out, you know, what do we know, what do we not know, what threats are real, which ones aren't. And he says, Alex, do I, have, I need your permission. Do I have your permission to send a crew of firefighters 
to New York. We've been asked for assistance and, you know, we have firefighters willing to go, uh, emergency responders, uh, but we need your okay to, to, to let them fly. And the first thing I'm thinking is, well, what if something happens here? You know, do we have the capacity to take care of ourselves? You know, there was still reports later that morning that the four planes were unaccounted for headed towards Los Angeles. And if somebody's attacking the country and they hit New York and D.C., guess who's next? You know, the money's on L.A. would be the next target. And so he, in about 10 seconds, reminds me of this whole mutual aid system that's in place in California. And bottom line says, yes, if the, you know, if something happens here, we will be okay, but we want to send a team, you know, we want to be helpful at Ground Zero. Uh, and so I said yes. And after airspace had been shut down by FAA that day, there was only one plane that took off, and that was firefighters from Los Angeles who were not only in New York, but briefed, trained, and literally helping at Ground Zero within 24 hours. So I just, you know, I look back, and that's one of the things I kind of feel proud about, being, uh, having the, uh, uh, the courage to say yes. The other was, I remember the first press conference when we were uh, uh, informing the public about, you know, what we knew and kind of what to do. The first day, as you can imagine, people just stayed home. People are scared, not knowing what was going on. And later on in that afternoon, we kind of verified through intelligence uh, folks that, you know, we were going to be okay, that none of the threats at Los Angeles were really credible. Uh, so my job as the acting mayor was not just to stand there at the press conference, but to lead the press conferences sort of informing the public. And I knew what the police chief was going to say. I knew what the fire chief was going to say. I knew what the head of the airport was going to say. But I kind of turned to them and I said, but what am I supposed to say? And they said, Alex, your job is to calm everybody down uh, and to tell people that come tomorrow to go back to normal, go back to your daily routine. And so we did that. Uh, and after the press conference, we huddled back in the uh, emergency operations center, and, I, and uh, everybody sitting around at the table, and I said, okay, well, you guys told me to tell everybody to go back to normal. How do we know if they listened? And everybody's looking at me. They're looking at each other like, what do you mean? What kind of a question is that? Well, you told me to tell everybody to go back to normal. How do we know if the message got through or not? And for all the systems and preparedness and protocols that are done ahead of time, you know, nobody knew the answer to that question. And then it just hit me because part of that emergency operations center is not just a liaison to the federal government, not just a liaison to the state government, but a liaison to the county government, a liaison to the MTA, a liaison to the school district, a liaison to all these other agencies. And so I said, well, if traffic is about 20% of what it normally is, then people didn't listen. If traffic is about 90% of what it normally is, People listened. Can I get a traffic report first thing in the morning? If school attendance is 50% of what it normally is, people didn't listen. If 90% of the kids are in schools, people listen. So let's kind of find out what those stats are, what those uh, uh, indicators are. And you know, most people did go back to normal. And um, just a couple of uh, tidbits of uh, memories. And during this time. Mayor Hahn is in D.C. Is he in communications with you, or are cell phones not working, or what's going on? No, cell, cell phones were working, and uh, we made it a point to try to stay in touch, you know, three, four times in the course of a day. You know, yes, he was out of town, and so I'm acting mayor, but sooner or later he was going to return, and he was the elected mayor. So, you know, I felt compelled to uh, not only keep him as informed as I possibly could, but, you know, say, here's, here's what I need to decide, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think? And, you know, for the most part, we pretty much agreed on everything. So it wasn't a matter of keeping him out of the loop or, or, or completely uh, uh, deferring to him on all the decisions. It was pretty collaborative. And, uh, you know, it was pretty frustrating for him not being able to get back more quickly. Uh, but at least he was in the loop. So you get elected uh, 1999. You become council president in 2001. How does that work? What do you guys do? G sit around in a conference room and say, I want to be president? No, I want to be president. At that time, the president of the council was um, Ruth Galanter, who represented this area. She'd been there for 16 years or so, and she wanted to be president, still wanted to be president. And you said, no, I've been here two years. You've been there 16 years. I want to be president. How, how, how does it work? Well, a, a couple things. Uh, I guess part of the context here is I, I was, yes, I was elected to the city council in 1999. But six years prior to that, in 1993, it was, that was the year that term limits had been adopted for 
the city officials, for, for the mayor, for, for the city council. So after that point, you couldn't serve more than two four-year terms, so eight years. So uh, when I was first elected, you know, a, a lot of the quote-unquote old-timers were there, people who had been on the city council, uh, in John Ferraro's case, longer than I had been alive. Uh, but so everybody's clock started ticking in 1993. Oh, yeah. So eight years later, in 2001, we knew that half of the city council was going to be forced to retire because of term limits, and new people would be coming in to take their place. And then in 2003, basically the other half of the council would be forced to retire because of term limits and new people coming in to take their place. So in a sense, generationally speaking, I was the first of sort of the new wave of representatives to be elected to the council. Being conscious of that, I figured, you know, number one, who wouldn't want to, if I'm going to be one of these 15 members, why wouldn't I try to be one of the leaders, if not the leader of the council to help set the agenda, help frame the debate, help set the budget priorities and anything else that's important to me. I figured the more influence I have in the city's decision making, the better for my district and, you know, the better for the city as I see it. So I put myself forward as a candidate, and a big part of my uh, case or campaign, if you will, for that was being this point of continuity in a transition, serving for two or four years with people who had been on the council for a very long time, trying to learn as much from them as possible uh, so that when the council completely turned over and a couple of years later, I was still the youngest member, but I had become also the senior member of the city council, being able to share that history uh, and... Uh, institutional memory, so, if you will. By with the time the you were members. 30, you were going to be the senior member of the council. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so that was one. You know, at the time, there was also this a question hanging over the city uh, that was forced by a lot of people from the San Fernando Valley, this question of secession. There was proposals not too long ago uh, asking whether the city of L.A. should remain intact as it is today or if it should be split up into maybe two or three or more smaller municipalities, the biggest of which would be the San Fernando Valley breaking off. So here I was, an elected official from the San Fernando Valley, saying, you know, I want to be the, you know, the leader of the city that may or may not exist in a couple of years. Uh, but I was, you know, personally against the, the breakup or the secession and figured, you know, what better way to demonstrate to the San Fernando Valley that we're better off staying together than to have somebody from the valley in that leadership position. Um, so in uh, 2003, you run for re-election? 2003, uh, no, 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 was re-elected in 2001. In 1999, I was elected to fill a vacancy, so only two years. Re-elected in 2001, re-elected in 2005. 2005, okay. And then Senate in 2006. So when you were re-elected in 2005, you still had a couple more years before you ran for the Senate. Right, I, I was elected to the Senate in November of 2006, so I... Uh, I resigned midterm from my position on city council. But wait a uh, minute, the city council pays 175,000, the state senate only pays 100,000. So you gave up $75,000 a year for the next three years? So, so you know I'm not in it for the money. Uh, not only that, that, that pension deal is not a bad deal. Well, oh, there is no pension deal for the, the, for the uh, state senate. Right, uh, in the state of California, for state legislators, not only are there term limits, but the same law that uh, put term limits into effect for members of the Assembly and the Senate, also repealed any pension benefits that uh, legislators get. So keep that in mind when you're mad at the legislature. Yeah. So when, who, who was the um, CAO when you first got elected? When I was first elected to the City Council, uh, it was actually just before uh, Bill Fujioka was appointed CAO of the city. Uh, so, and one of the first, you know, votes I had to take was to whether or not, whether or not to confirm uh, Bill Fujioka as CAO of the city, who has since gone on to be the CAO of Los Angeles County. Right. And then after he left, who became the CAO? No, he was there until I, I, I left before he did. Okay, so you only served with him one, one whole time. So you never went through the process of trying to hire one. No, we, what we did do is we went through the process of hiring a CLA. Uh, the chief. Explain that to the students. So, that so the is CA very unique. Only the city of LA has this. <laughs> so the CAO of the city of Los Angeles, as you heard in the introduction, is sort of the chief uh, financial advisor, fiscal officer, if you will, for the city. He's in charge of the books and reports both to the mayor and to the council. 
Now, some people will say, well, the CAO really reports more to the mayor because that's who appoints him. Uh, Is that true, Miko? I think Saturday's article proved that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but most CAOs know, you know, you can't help but be professional in that job or you're not going to last long. So you report to, to everybody. Well, the mayor appoints, the council <coughs> confirms, so there you go. Uh, but the mayor, uh, mayor's office has a pretty sizable staff, and they can dedicate themselves to, you know, research, policy, anything that they want. The council, any individual council member, uh, at most has about 20 people on staff. So from a capacity standpoint, it's kind of hard to compete with a mayor, whether the mayor has 100 people, 150 people, you know, all the department has reported to them. Uh, so the city council as a body has a support office known as the Chief Legislative Analyst's Office. So that's a team of analysts, policy analysts, as well as, as budget analysts, that report and advise the city council as a body. Uh, and the, the top person in that office is known as the Chief Legislative Analyst. When I was first elected, the Chief Legislative Analyst was a guy by the name of Ron Deaton, uh, who was there for more than half of the time I was on council. They used to call him the 16th council member. Right, because of his influence. He had been there so long. He was pretty much the go-to guy for you where every body was buried. Policy, institutional memory, buried the body. You know, political experience and advice for the council in negotiations sometimes with, sometimes against whoever the mayor of the time uh, was. So uh, Mayor Hahn appointed him to head up the Department of Water and Power back in, I want to say it was about 2004, more or less. And so, 2004, 2005, and the council went through a process of, oh my gosh, how do you replace, you know, this person, this trusted advisor who's been in this position for a, a long, long time? Uh, and so we did. You know, you go kind of go through a search process. You turn, you search internally within the city, not just that office, but in other city departments and agencies. Is there someone who would be good in this role? We searched outside city government uh, to see if there was other uh, people throughout the state and throughout the country who would be good. In, in this particular role. And we ended up uh, uh, selecting a person who was one of the right-hand people for Ron Dean to continue in that capacity. Hey, uh, let me switch topics a little bit. Why does everybody hate the DWP? Uh, the Department of Water and Power, uh, if you think about it, the, the, we in the city of Los Angeles have cheaper energy than most major cities in America. We have very secure energy, meaning when we had the energy crisis not too long ago, lights were going off all over California, but not in L.A. Um, we have uh, very secure water and, again, cheap water compared to others, yet we're always constantly complaining about the Department of Water and Power. Why well, is that? Well, Professor, when you say everybody hates DWP and we're always complaining, who's everybody and who's we? Me. You? Just you. <laughs> Well, we're, uh, no, if, no, you take, I, if you take a look at the press and blogs, if you take a look at, you know. So, so that's kind of my point exactly. Um, the, uh, if, you, if you listen to the headlines and the blogosphere and everything else, then you know, you know, the DWP, is, DWP is a favorite target for a lot of people. But uh, I'll tell you this, you know, every time I, I campaign for office and I go door to door, whether it's to gather signatures to qualify for the ballot or to ask for votes, you know, before election day, uh, I can't recall more than a handful of times that people have said, you know, you know, how are you going to do this with DWP, or I won't vote for you unless you do that to DWP, or, you know, anything like that. So there's always, you know, sort of the, the press and the uh, inner political circles and what we think and what people are rallying against, and then there's the general public uh, and, and people as a whole. And sometimes those two you know, concerns or priorities are in alignment. And sometimes it's almost like if you're talking to two different worlds. Uh, so uh, having seen both at the community level what people think about DWP, uh, as well as in polling, you, know, you ask people, are you happy with your uh, service? Uh, most people are generally satisfied. I think to the extent that there's frustration with DWP, it's because of what you read in the headlines from time to time. Oh, they want to increase our rates. Well, who wants their rates increased ever? Nobody. Uh, no, so LME students don't <laughs> mind when we raise tuition. They're happy about it. The, the other piece is sometimes your bills can be pretty confusing, right? When you're paying that bill every you know, other month and you're looking at not just, well, how much energy did I use and why did I have to pay this much and there's this complicated formula uh, or how, how much uh, water did I use, but then a lot of the surcharges that people don't really think about appear on your 
water and power bill. Like, how did that get there? Why do I have to pay for this? The trash bill. A lot of times, right, when we're voting, your, 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 your sanitation charges, your fees, appear on your Department of Water and Power bill, but also, you know, not so much DWP, but your property tax. Every time you hear during an election, vote yes for this measure to fund transportation or vote yes for that bond measure to fund schools. Well, guess what? At some point, we're actually paying those bills, and they don't appear at the top of the list uh, on a bill like that, but they're in there, and that adds up to a big number. That's not always easy to understand. So I think the Department of Water and Power and other agencies, for that matter, can be uh, a little bit better about communicating to the general public about what their bill means, and maybe some of the anger will go away. Yeah, I mean, I think the average bill for a household is like six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800. But like you said, it comes every other month. It includes water, includes energy, includes sanitation and all that. I think it's just bad PR that it all comes in one bill. Is it, you should you get one bill for water? I know it's more bureaucracy, but from a policy and, and political perspective, it would be easier for people to understand what they're paying, and people are used to paying on a monthly basis, not, not on a, on a bi-monthly basis. Uh, Miguel, but there was a big controversy last year with the DWP. Explain to the students what happened with, quote, unquote, the DWP not paying, uh, it, it is a, a entity, a utility that is owned by the people of Los Angeles. So we ask it at the end of every year to give the people, mean the general fund, some money. And, and how much of that do you depend on? How much are you going to get? What happened last year? Uh, that's correct. It's, it's a, it, it, you should think about it as a business that is owned by all of you. And so as a result, you are the, the shareholders, if you will, that benefit from any surplus that the agency produces. And so the, the DWP on an annual basis provides the city, um, you know, it ranges between 230 to 270 million dollars a year uh, to help pay for libraries, parks, police officers, firefighters. And so that surplus or that profit gets reinvested back into city services. So last year there was a, a, a controversy around that surplus. We budget every year uh, that we're gonna get so much. And because we had such a tight fiscal year last year, uh, we really needed that check. And normally it comes in and, and there's nothing really talked about it. There's little interest around it. But this last year there, the, the mayor um, was uh, advocating for uh, a strategy uh, around renewable energy, trying to get the city to be a leader nationally, internationally, in using renewable energy to keep the lights on. And so the DWP was saying, if we're going to do that, uh, we're going to have to, it's going to end up costing more, at least initially, and uh, was advocating for a rate increase um, to meet that goal. And so the city council, uh, the, the DAP voted on that increase, um, and the city council either could decide whether they're going to support it or whether they're not. And so there was enough uh, folks on the city council who said, we're not prepared to do that. And so they held that item and ended up not supporting it. The city council, the, the DWP operates independent. Uh, most matters that the DWP does does not go before the city council unless the city council decides that they want to take it up. And so this one they decided to take up. And so it, it got caught in um, a, a, a struggle between the mayor who had very specific policy goals and a council that felt that at this, some of them felt that at this point in time, you know, it's a too much of an increase for ratepayers to pay during a recession or whatever the argument is. The collateral in between became that payment that we get. And so um, as a result, the payment was delayed. Um, because we were in such tight fiscal, uh, in a, such a tight fiscal place, um, the bond rating agencies that I started talking about initially uh, said, you guys are not going to be able to end the year in the black. It looks like if you don't get this money, you're actually going to end up in trouble. And, um, and they downgraded us. They dropped our, our FICA score, as Dr. Guerra talked about, and, uh, which made it more expensive to borrow, as we do, which heightened the drama uh, in the city. 
Um, and so then the controller issued a letter saying who she's in charge of our checking account. And she issued a letter saying, uh, your checking account is close to empty. Uh, and if you don't get this, this uh, transfer, it's going to be totally empty before the fiscal year is over. And so that prompted a reaction from the mayor and from the council. And guess what? We got downgraded again <laughs> for that. So in turn, you know, it all got settled to, to some extent. We ended up getting our money. There was a compromise reached on what the increase would be. Um, and, you know, hopefully when all of you vote in March, you'll see a measure on the ballot that says that in the future, the DWP will tell us a year in advance exactly how much we're going to get and uh, we'll be deliver on that amount. And frankly, they should be able to do that because the amount that we get is based on the previous year's earnings. They're not based on the existing year's earnings. One year behind. And so, so the goal is to sort of depoliticize this issue, if you will, and, and make it a, a, a reliable source of revenue uh, for the city in the future. Uh, Senator Jerry Brown. What's the he governor. Like? What's he like? Uh, How much have you interacted with him? Uh, more than a handful of times, actually. He's, he's been uh, uh, more than accessible to me, let's just, uh, put it that way. He's, I don't know how much you guys have studied him uh, historically and what he was like when he was, you know, first governor a couple of decades ago and sort of what his reputation. Before you were even born. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what sort of his reputation is, uh, my, my description would be he can come across kind of quirky, but he's a pretty bright guy. Uh, he's, he's certainly smart, he's certainly sharp. I think some people have a tough time understanding him sometimes because when you're, there's, there's times when you're talking to him and it's like he's carrying on three, four conversations simultaneously. And I've had a few meetings with him where we you know, come in, sit down, and it's, the meeting's supposed to be about, you know, say some energy issue. And so we'll start talking about that and then he'll interrupt with a question about a completely different topic. And then so we start kind of going down that conversation and then he'll interrupt and make a comment on the third issue. And then he'll come back to the first one. Then there's the fourth one. And then he goes back to the third one. And, and, but 20 minutes later, we would actually have concluded. Sounds like one of my lectures. All, <laughs> all, the, all the issues. So you know, maybe I think his, his mind is just that quick. Uh, but if you can kind of keep up and, and keep it organized, uh, you can kind of see where he's going. You know, it sounds uh, uh, hokey, but I think it's completely true. You know, what are some of the taglines from his campaign? You know, at this stage in his life, I'm prepared to do, you know, make the tough decisions. I think he's doing that, uh, particularly through this budget. Uh, there's huge, un hugely unpopular elements of his proposed budget on how to get our fiscal house in order. But it's uh, more of an honest budget than the previous governor uh, put forward. And to his credit, he's sort of holding firm. Uh, equally with Republicans and Democrats on what needs to be done. You know, just, just like the city, uh, just like the Department of Water and Power, the state itself has a bond rating that it needs to care about. And right now, the state's bond rating is not very good uh, at all. Uh, so I just want to underscore, I, I wasn't here for most of it, but the bond rating conversation took place prior to my arrival. I mean, that is hugely, hugely critical. Uh, for any uh, governmental entity and it's something that some of my colleagues understand and appreciate and some don't you know it's it's not comfortable or easy to come in and say well we're gonna have to cut whether it's education spending or health care spending or you know police services or, or anything else uh, but sometimes the cost of not making those tough decisions makes a problem you know exponentially worse down the road yeah um, we're gonna uh have some of the students begin to ask questions. So if you're interested in asking a question, just line up over here by the mic. Um, the governor did decide not to sell some state buildings that would have provided a billion something. I want you to comment on that. And then Miguel, how is the governor stopping the sale of state buildings different than what the city's trying to do in terms of trying to sell parking garages, which I think you just uh, announced last week that nobody wanted to buy them. So, uh, Alex, um, 
What, what's your stance? Did he do the right thing by not selling the buildings, or would you have wanted the $1.5 billion or whatever it was? No, I, I think the governor did the right thing in stopping the sale of, of some of the, a handful of state buildings uh, throughout the state for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, just if you can all afford avoiding that scenario, the worst time to sell real estate assets is in a down real estate market because uh, you're going to get a lot less than they're probably worth in, in due time, uh, you know, and, and well, it's just the worst time you can possibly do it. Uh, second, there were particularly, there was a lot of red flags with the process for how this sale was proceeding. Uh, there was a sort of an RFP process, a competitive process for, okay, we want to sell these 11 buildings, who wants to buy them, and tell us what kind of a, a price you're willing to pay. And there were several proposals that came by way of the state. Uh, there was one proposal that would have resulted in more money up front to the state, and after a term of about you know, 30 years or so, the state would have been able to take those buildings back uh, and retain ownership long term. That proposal did not win, and the proposal that was going forward was one that resulted in less money up front for the state, and at the end of that same time period, that entity got to keep the buildings. So one oh, yeah. meant that, more that money for the make, state, and we keep the buildings. That doesn't make sense. And, but that was a proposal that had been selected by the previous governor and was being executed. Some people took that decision to court, kind of bought some time. Uh, judges sort of intervened and afforded the new governor the opportunity to say, do you still want to go down this road or not? And uh, he pulled the plug on it. And you're trying to sell the parking garages, some of the parking garages that are owned by the city of Los Angeles, but you just announced last week that nobody wants to buy them. Well, we're, we're not selling, we're leasing them out, um, and we're, it's, it's, in, it's an entirely different plan than the governor. I think the governor made the right call on, on the state buildings. Uh, the biggest difference is that our offices aren't in parking garages. Uh, in the case of the state, the buildings that are being sold, they need to be in as their offices. So they needed to engage in a lease back of the very same buildings that they were selling. In, this, in, the, state, in the case of the city, uh, we have uh, nine garages. Uh, they're in you know, Westwood, Hollywood, downtown, in a variety of different areas. And we, we manage them, um, and we don't manage them very well. Um, so city employees don't park in them. We, we don't park in They're available to the public. Uh, we currently subsidize uh, many of the garages, uh, and as a result, there is a reduced or no fee to parking those garages. What we were arguing is that we, because we don't do a great job managing them, they're currently about 50% occupied, because we're actually losing money in running these garages, the city should not be in the parking garage business at all. And instead, go to the private sector and see if they would be interested in managing them with, for a dollar amount up front. And because of our fiscal crisis, uh, we are in need of funding up front. And one of the things that we need to do with that funding is bring up our reserve or our savings account which is part of what determines what our bond rating, aid, uh, bond rating is, um, so that it's at a healthy level. You know, they want to make sure that we have enough money in our savings account should we not be able to meet our budget so we could dip into our savings account to pay out bondholders who to pay our debt. Um, one of the things, if we're going to be out of the garage business, then we need to sort of let go control. So for example, there's, there's a lot in Westwood. It's the only lot in the city that actually provides free parking. Um, and if we're gonna ask somebody to write us a big check at the beginning uh, of a 50 year process, they're not gonna make any money if it's free. And so if we wanted to make this, get the most out of the garage, maximize it as an asset, we need to decide that we can no longer provide free parking and the market will determine what the rates are. You mean a student at UCLA can go over in Westwood and park for free instead of paying those high prices for parking and just get away with it? Right, that's, that's, a, that's something that the city does. And in Hollywood and Highland is another area you know, it's, it was, you know, the, the big, 
you know, development where the Academy Awards are held, we provide a subsidy there that allows you to park for, two, uh, for four hours and instead of paying $6 an hour, you get validated and pay $2. Now in most places when you go to the Grove or go to the mall and get validation, the retailers pay for that subsidy. In the case of the city, the taxpayers pay. And the, the, that loss in revenue comes straight out of the city's coffers. And so again, we, we were transferring that restriction onto the private operator. And if they're going to try to make a profit, they're saying, I can't make it if you am required to provide this subsidized parking. And so the reason why we didn't get too much interest is because we put a number of restrictions around uh, the parking garages and, and still indicated our... Did you put those restrictions? No, it was, I mean, ultimately the policymakers made those restrictions in, in response to concerns from the community um, in that surrounding area. Um, very legitimate concerns. Um, and this is where you have two conflicting interests. One, the interest of residents and merchants and the other, the citywide interest of managing uh, a budget and trying to s keep it balanced. And so we try to do something in between and release it and didn't get that much interest. At the end of the day, it is a policy call. If we choose to be in the parking garage business, then we need to figure out how to do a much better job at it. You just told me you're not very good at it. So yeah. why, why would you stay Well, in Well, because there are ways that we could be better at it. We could on ourselves charge market rates or uh, some version of that. We could uh, uh, have private operators run them. Um, we could invest in them. If you go to Pershing Square, which is in the middle of downtown, you know, it hasn't been painted since the 80s. You know, many of the lights aren't working. The escalators often not working. The restrooms are not exactly the cleanest. It's not, it's not something that, you know, frankly, we've spent too much investing in. Um, but if we choose to do that, then we need to make it part of our mission and really invest in them adequately. Or just get out of it altogether, try to maximize it as an asset. And so tomorrow the council will be discussing Sort of, sort of this threshold question, and it really is about a bigger conversation about what the role of the city is. You know, as, as we get through these very difficult times, we need to ask ourselves on a variety of different services three basic questions. Should we still be providing this service? Is there a reason why we need to do this? If, if the answer is yes, are we the only ones who could do it? Could someone else do it cheaper, more effectively, if we partner with them? And the third question is, if we're the only ones that could do it, like police, how do we do it more effectively? How do we make it more efficient? And so by going through this process, we start narrowing down what ultimately our, our, our core mission is. And I often can sort of compare it to, to In-N-Out Burger. You know, when my kids come in from New York, the first place they want to go is to In-N-Out. And the reason why is because they make great hamburgers. And they've decided that hamburgers is their core mission. That's what they're going to make. They're not going to make tacos. They're not going to make, you know, burritos. Hamburgers is what they did. And they figured out how to do it really, really well. We as a city are going through the same thing. We need to decide what is our core mission. What is it that only we as a city can do? And how do we perfect that? And then that makes decisions about cuts a lot easier to make because if it doesn't fit into that core mission, then it's secondary. And building that consensus, of course, is not an easy thing to do. But the garages is really sort of uh, a discussion around that. Alex, if you were mayor, what would you do with these parking garages? With the parking garages? Yeah. Uh, not knowing more about the other proposals on the table, I think it's from, from, from what I've read, from what I've heard, from talking to the mayor, from talking to council members, uh, a lot of the, the cuts that have been, that could be made, have been made already. I mean, you're really scraping the bottom in terms of your options uh, to keep the city's budget balanced and in some semblance of shape to be able to rebuild when the economy turns. Uh, and this parking garage issue, it's uh, maybe, maybe not fun, uh, maybe not comfortable, but almost necessary at this point. Uh, Alex, if you were mayor, would you sell the zoo? <laughs> if I was mayor, I wouldn't sell the zoo, but I would uh, uh, certainly put, uh, uh, turn up the heat 
uh, under the butts of the of what's known as GLAZA, the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. It's a, sort of a nonprofit uh, sister entity to the zoo that raises a lot of private money to help subsidize the zoo. So the better they perform, then uh, you kind of ease the burden on the city's general fund to keep the zoo going. Hmm. Alex, if you were mayor, um, what would you do with the convention center? I would which keep Miguel Santana. No more. <laughs> What would you do with a convention center? It loses a ton of money. It loses a ton of money. It's an interesting timing of that question because one of the meetings I had today in, the, in my capital office was with uh, Tim Lewicki, who many of you have probably been reading about in the newspaper. He's the, the head of AEG, uh, the folks proposing this concept to build a football stadium or arena right downtown next to the convention center, next to uh, the Staples Center. And part of their proposal is to not just take over some of the uh, land where the convention center sits uh, and not knock down convention center space to have a smaller convention center, but replace old convention center space with newer, more modern convention center space that's more adjacent to the rest of the convention center, make room for a football stadium. And part of the, the financing to make that all happen, uh, actually they're going to take on some of the debt obligation for uh, the city or the convention center, which is part of the city, uh, sounds almost too good to be true, but I think there's a huge opportunity here for the city of Los Angeles to either lower its debt or restructure its debt. Uh, when it comes time, Miguel can tell you to do the city's budget every year, uh, it's a, almost like a bad joke. One of the first things you do is write a check to the convention center because it's been a money loser uh, almost since, since day one. So if there's a way to uh, kind of put some light at the end of the tunnel for when that that uh, sinkhole uh, goes away, then I think it's better for the city. So I know we're going to have some students ask some questions very soon, especially if they want to get a decent grade in my class. Um, hey, uh, Alex, if you were mayor, um, would you support the NFL project as you know it right now? Are you in favor of that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it would, the way it's been described to me, uh, it's a very... Uh, uh, multi-dimensional proposal. It's not just about a, a stadium to have eight home games and maybe some playoff uh, out of the year and that's it. I mean, the, and the folks from AEG, uh, I've had dealings with them over the years from the Staples Center, the LA Life Development, et cetera. Uh, they talk a big game, but they certainly back it up. And the proposal for the football stadium includes not just football, but whether it's concerts, whether it's X Games, whether it's soccer, whether it's other things, to get a lot more use out of that facility than a typical football stadium around the country. Uh, it would also drive a lot of other commercial and retail development in that general area, including construction of more hotels. So the, the possible benefits here go far beyond just you know, having a team uh, in Los Angeles, but it can drive a lot of economic activity both in the, in the hospitality and tourism sector as well as the construction sector uh, right in the downtown. If you were, no, well, why don't I just ask you, uh, in 2013, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa is termed out. He cannot run for re-election. So are you going to run for mayor? <laughs> uh, a yes or no question? It's a yes or no question. <laughs> The answer is I'm certainly looking at it. I'm doing my homework. It's a, it's a big decision, not just sort of a, of a, it's not just a political decision. For me, it's a personal decision. I love my job, love public service. I've gone from How much city council to paid? state senate. Uh, mayor gets paid 250000 You're making like 100000 right now. Right. Well, that, that's easy. We, we, we've already established I'm not doing this for the money. <laughs> okay, so what would be the factors that would determine whether you run for mayor or not? You know, it's uh, the, the process I'm going through right now includes, uh, you know, if I, if I decide to run for mayor, uh, am I doing it for the right reasons? I don't want to do it just because it's a great title or, you know, it sounds good or even because I think I'd be a, a viable candidate. But is that really what I want? And do I, do I think I bring to not just the campaign but the office, the experience, the skill set, the judgments uh, and, and the strength to make the decisions that are best for the future of the city. Number one. Number two, I know full well, having worked with Mayor Reardon, Mayor Hahn, and now Mayor Villaraigosa, that no mayor can do it alone. Uh, you have to have a good team in place to execute on, on that vision uh, and help lead the city. Uh, so what kind of team 
would I, do I think I'd be able to sort of rally around, uh, again, not just a campaign, uh, but uh, the actual office. And lastly, uh, in, in, in Los Angeles, unlike New York, unlike Boston, unlike Chicago, unlike a lot of major cities in America, it's not a strong mayor form of government. It's a strong council form of government. So for a mayor to be successful, there's got to be the, the collaboration, uh, the cooperation, and, and the support on the city council branch of city government as well. Uh, you know, I used to serve on the city council. I know most of the council members very well, uh, but even that body's going to change again due to term limits. So, uh, you know, do you want to walk into a scenario where uh, you're optimizing your chances to succeed with your vision, or where you're going to have a tough, uh, steep hill to climb? Uh, Miguel, you talk to the mayor just about every day, sometimes three or four times a day. Not talking about Antonio Villaraigosa or Alex Padilla, but from your perspective, what are the skill sets? What is it required in someone being an effective mayor in Los Angeles? What, what would you like to see in that person? I think it's leadership. I, I think it being. But we always say that. What is leadership? Well, leadership is being able to um, go back to your own constituency and being able to tell them not necessarily what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And being able to. Uh, present, uh, being honest about the challenges that uh, that person is changing, the, the trade-offs for the policy decisions that need to be made, uh, whether it's the fact that everybody wants to have great services but nobody wants to pay more taxes, or, or the challenges of, of, of just governing. Um, to me, I think that's, you know, the, uh, effective leadership not just for the mayor, but in any capacity is is um, having the wherewithal to be able to engage in the public in a direct and honest way and still survive that process, being smart, having command of the issues, being decisive, and, um, all of those things. But first and foremost is, is the, having that ability to do that. Um, on March 8th, we're going to have a citywide election where I th uh, half the city council is up for election. On March 9th, the law reads, I believe, that people who want to run for mayor can start raising money because it's a two-year, right? And, and there will be numerous members of the city council who are going to run for mayor. Does, how difficult does that make your job that you have the current mayor that you're dealing with, the city council, including three or four who are going to be running for mayor? Well, I, I think it, it, it makes every decision that much more politicized, that much more part of the equation of, of the impact it has on someone's candidacy or likelihood. Um, um, I think from that standpoint, I think it, it, and it's more sort of the chatter outside of city that's watching the city than the chatter inside of the city. Um, um, but I think that, you know, there aren't, the, the future is a very difficult one uh, for both the state and, and for the city and for most governments. It's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a time where you could take a position of, of um, sort of a populist position against cuts or against make, you know, making, uh, going against tough decisions. I think everybody's recognizing that, that we're in an environment and a, and a context in which you know, we all have to sort of roll up our sleeves and figure out how we're going to get through it. Yeah. Um, Alex, uh, when, when you take a look at uh, uh, political leaders, political mentors, people like that, who do you consider someone that you would politically like to style yourself uh, like, that you've watched their careers and say, I want to be a public servant like that individual? Uh, who, who would that be? The... Um uh, sort of a two-part two answer, if I can. Um, I, I will answer your question with a specific name in a second, but uh, first, you know, for, for most uh, higher offices, you know, whether you're running for state senate or assembly or city council, of course, mayor, et cetera, uh, most uh, candidates will have sort of a campaign team around them that includes some consultants. Uh, and I say that because I'm the kind of person that I have found over the years frustrates my political consultants. 
uh, everybody wants to know for the purposes of message and communications, you know, what's the thing you want to be known for? Do you want to be the education legislator? Do you want to be the, the health care legislator? Do you want to be the law and order candidate for mayor? Do you want to be the this or that? Well, so you are running for and, mayor. And mm. the, my response is always this. It's like it's hard for me to pick just one because how do I go back to my constituents and say education is number one? What, and creating jobs is secondary? Or creating jobs is number one, but public safety is secondary? Or public safety is number one, but you know, affordable housing is secondary? They're all important. So to me, I'd rather be known as the person who is effective and can get things done, you know, regardless of what the issue is, because they're all priorities, really. Now, they're tough because budgets are finite and we have to establish priorities, but as, as long as I'm seen as sort of an effective uh, uh, person, whether I'm in city council or in the state senate or anywhere else, that's what I like to be known for. The uh, if I had to pick a person, because there, there's a few out there, but uh, once upon a time back in the mid '90s, I worked for Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, who made a big impression on me, not just as a former boss, but boy, you never want to go into a meeting with Senator Feinstein unless you're absolutely prepared, because uh, she to this day doesn't. Uh, cease to surprise me in how knowledgeable she is on almost any and every issue that you can imagine, whether it's national security, whether it's water infrastructure, whether it's budgets, whether it's you know anything else. I uh, learned a lot from how she runs her office and how she prepares herself uh, and how, how she has very high expectations of her staff. So uh, if there's one person out of the box that I'd point to, it'd be her. Okay, hey, let's take a question over here. Uh, my question is for Mr. Santana. And has the city of LA ever seen a budget surplus at the end of its fiscal year, ever? And is that a possibility for LA, or is the goal now just to decrease our debt? Uh, there was a time that the city did face surpluses. That was, you know, when the senator was on the was the council president. Um, the city, the county, the state at one point had a surplus. Even the federal government had a surplus during the 90s. Um, the, the, the era of surplus, I mean, during that time, I was at the county at the time, we could have never imagined that we would be in the situation we are. The, the, and there will be a time again in your lifetime and in mine that government will experience a surplus. It's part of the cycle. The, the, the important thing is that we learn from the time that we're experiencing now. And the surpluses are exactly that. They're extra money that you did not plan for. And so it's sort of like finding 20 bucks in your, in, you know, in your old jacket or something. You could, if you were to buy, you know, let's say you found $200. If you were to go buy a car with the $200 and knowing that, that, hoping that in your next jacket you're gonna find another $200 and finding out that it's not there, that's where you run into problems because now you incurred an ongoing responsibility with this new car and now you no longer have that $200. The, the, the thing that we should learn from the time that we're facing now, and hopefully we will when we experience a surplus, is to use that surplus wisely. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to invest in your infrastructure, which is one time. It's an opportunity to pay off old debt, you know, pay off those credit cards, you know, do an advance on your mortgage, you know, all of the things that you're supposed to do. Um, and so that, doing that allows you to still benefit from that surplus while not creating problems in the future. Uh, Miguel Santana started working this morning at six o'clock in the morning and he's still a uh, slacker. <laughs> and he uh, is here late with us and he's gonna start working tomorrow morning very early. Uh, State Senator Alex Padilla was in session in Sacramento today uh, and the uh, session will be happening tomorrow and he'll be flying back. He flew all the way over here just to be with us and he's gonna be flying right back. So I want you to give both of these gentlemen a good hand. <laughs>